Hello and welcome to episode number 582 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. I'm Sarah Wendell. And today my guest is Lorelai King. Lorelai has been a guest on the show before, and you may recognize her name and certainly her voice from her work in romance audiobook narration. This week, Lorelai is joining me to talk about her role as a core participant in the official UK government COVID inquiry, which begins its second phase on October 3rd. We also discuss her volunteer work on the COVID memorial wall in London. Now, I want to give you a few warnings. We're going to talk about COVID and about death as Lorelai's husband died from COVID in March of 2020. We're also going to talk about Boris Johnson and his WhatsApp message, so big content warning for buffoonery. And I want to give you a heads up that this episode may not be what you want to listen to because we're going to talk about death and grief, and that's okay. So please look after yourself. We're talking about some difficult things, but it's fundamentally about living with grief and finding hope and finding purpose after a terrible loss. I really found this conversation to be very hopeful and really moving, so I hope you enjoy it as well. I want to send a special hello and thank you to our Patreon community who makes sure that every episode has a transcript and keeps me going week after week. If you have supported the show, thank you. I have a compliment this week as well to Kim K. Whenever you walk in the room, everyone in the room including the cats, any birds, miscellaneous mammals, all of them think to themselves, yes, Kim is here because you are great. If you would like a compliment of your very own or you'd like to find out how to support this podcast, patreon.com slash smartbitches is where you can find all of the details. And I want to send a hello to Tracy, who is the newest member of our Patreon community. Thank you to all of you for your support. It means so very, very much. Support for this episode comes from Earth Breeze. I have been watching highlight reels of people who go out in kayaks near my hometown of Pittsburgh and elsewhere as they clean up rivers and streams and they pull a staggering amount of plastic waste out of the water. It's really startling to see how many laundry jugs end up as pollution. So when I was invited to try Earth Breeze, I was extremely excited. Earth Breeze looks like a dryer sheet. But it's not. It's a liquidless laundry detergent sheet that dissolves 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. No measuring, no mess, no dripping, no heavy lifting, and no plastic jug. EarthBreeze has thought of everything. The packaging is a lightweight cardboard envelope that saves space and avoids the plastic jug. When my packet arrived, Adam actually thought it was a book. EarthBreeze is compatible with high-efficiency washers, gray water systems, and is septic safe. The eco sheets are hypoallergenic and dermatologist tested. Does it work? Oh, yes, it does. You use exactly the right amount of each sheet, depending on how large of a load of laundry you're doing. It's tough on stains, it fights odors, and my clothes come out fresh and clean every time. Right now, my listeners can subscribe to EarthBreeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash Sarah. That's earthbreeze.com slash Sarah for 40% off earthbreeze.com slash Sarah. Okay, I think it makes perfect sense to talk to one of the most prominent and well-recognized audiobook narrators in the romance genre about the COVID government inquiry, right? No, actually, this is the perfect person to talk to about this. And I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. On with the podcast. Hi, I'm Laura Liking. I'm an actress, a writer, and an audiobook narrator. Uh, I'm an American, but I've lived in the UK for the last 10,000 years. 10,000 years. <laughs> it feels like it sometimes, Sarah. I bet. Well, we, we, have, we have talked before about audiobook narration. We have, I've listened to your book about audio and audiobook narration, which is top notch. Yeah. I love it very much. Is that Storyteller, How to Be an Audiobook Narrator? That is, in fact, Storyteller, How to Be an Audiobook Narrator. Always, always plug. <laughs> hey, that's, that's, that's why we do what we do. But I've, I've been following you on Twitter for a very, very long time, partially because I, like, I'm a fan. Um, and also we come from the same place. So every so often you make a joke that I particularly get, like, right, it hits me right in the funny bone. Um, so I've been following you on Twitter for a really long time. And I've been following your coverage of the UK COVID inquiry. So I thought it makes all the sense in the world for me to connect to a romance and mystery audiobook narrator to talk about the UK COVID inquiry. Please tell me about the COVID inquiry because you are actually there. You are witnessing it. You are present. What, What is this? What's going on? And how many umbrellas have you needed to bring? 
<laughs> yeah, umbrellas is right because of the rain, rain, rain. What a summer. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for asking. Uh, secondly, forgive me, I'm going to say inquiry. I know say, we say in inquiry in Britain, they say inquiry, so that's how I got used to saying it. Um, and the COVID inquiry is something that's been consuming my life for a while now. Bit of background. My husband died of COVID-19 in March of 2020, early in the pandemic. And later that year, I joined an activist group, the COVID Bereaved Families for Justice. And the aim of the group, besides being a support for COVID Bereaved, uh, the aim was to get an inquiry into the pandemic. Because I think having been so um, traumatized ourselves by our bereavement, we thought it was important to address what went wrong and, and how we could learn from that so that in future, maybe other people wouldn't have to suffer the way that we did. And just to explain a little bit about what the inquiry is, some countries already have had their inquiries, like Sweden, France, Italy, I think. The difference between that, those are non-statutory inquiries. This is a statutory inquiry. As far as I know, it may be the only, only one in the world at the moment. And the U UK is unique in this way. And what that means is that a statutory inquiry has a judge, it has legal power to force witnesses to testify and to produce evidence and documents. It is a criminal offense to try to obstruct an inquiry. And once the statutory inquiry is established, it operates completely independently of the government. Uh, the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson was the one who established uh, this inquiry after we fought for it hard uh, in, in the group. And yes, I'm, I'm there either in person or online because it's also broadcast online every day, because I'm what's called a core participant through the COVID Brief Families for Justice. What that means is that I have legal representation at the inquiry. Uh, we're not the only core participants. There are, there are others, but I think we're probably one of the most vocal, <laughs> one of the most vocal groups. It will go on for some years and it's structured in modules. We've just finished module one, which dealt with preparation. And believe me, there are many lessons to be learned there. Uh, and in the fall, now is module two, which deals with government's actions and decisions during the pandemic. That's a huge module. That's going to be a big one. We did have the politicians testifying, but many more politicians will be testifying in this one. And there are several modules that follow on from that. Uh, at the moment, it's six modules. They deal with healthcare settings, care homes, vaccination. I mean, as an activist group, we have our issues with the inquiry. There are things about it we don't like. The stories of the bereaved have not been able to be told. Our lawyers are not permitted to question witnesses, uh, except in the most limited way. They submit questions they want to ask a witness, and they may be given five minutes at the end of a, of a hearing day to ask that question. They may be asked to rewrite the question according to what the inquiry wants. So um, that doesn't make us happy. We're also very unhappy with the government who... As I said, they have to provide evidence if asked by the chair. The chair is Baroness Hallett, a very experienced judge. And she asked for Boris Johnson's WhatsApp messages and oh. some other things. And they they went to court to stop us. They went to court and there was a judicial review at the high court. We all went just to be, be there. And of course, the court ruled in our favor and said, you have to give the inquiry these documents. Now, that's what I mean when I talk about the difference. Uh, an inquiry such as run in the other countries won't have that power. People can just say, no, go away. So we've got that. So there's been a delay in that particular evidence, which is for the, this module, module two. So I said, it's going to go on for some years. And our hope is that this investment of time and money, because it's expensive, the taxpayer is paying for it, uh, will help us deal with things better in the future. And although we're a group of bereaved and arguably the most active and much of it is being driven by the bereaved. Uh, in fact, it's an inquiry for, for all of us. The, the whole country can benefit from this, bereaved and non-bereaved, because it's not just looking at the spread of the disease and the deaths that were caused. It was also other things. The fact people lost their businesses because of lockdown. Um, schools were closed. There have been some developmental problems, I understand, with some ages of children because of that. The one I think is most cruel is people with dementia living in care homes couldn't be visited by their families for a year more and felt abandoned. And that kind of cruelty can't happen again. Now, I'm not saying there's any easy answers, but I'm saying this is a chance for us to address the issue and try to find better ways to do it in, in future.
you just tell me to stop talking when you want to. But just to explain that ordinarily with the statutory inquiry, when the inquiry is over, they make the recommendations. Not in this case. Baroness Hallett is going to give her recommendations at the end of each module, which I think is great, rather than having to wait four years or whatever. So module one recommendations will come in summer of 2024, I believe. I don't think my involvement with this cause is going to is going to end anytime soon, because the whole thing about recommendations is that they have to be enacted yeah. by whichever government is in power. Mm-hmm. And one thing I learned in module one preparation, when they do, they've done exercises in the past. Recommendations are made, they ignore them on a personal level. It gives my life purpose. You know, I felt I felt kind of purposeless, rudderless after the death of my husband. And, and much of what I do now is to to honor him, to honor his memory. Well, first... I'm so sorry. Thank you. So the, one of the things that your coverage has reminded me of um, here in the States after 9-11, a lot of the widows of men who died in 9-11, firefighters, people in the World Trade Center, people in the Pentagon, a lot of the widows got together and were like, no, 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 no. We're going to hold you accountable for what you did and didn't do because there, there was warning. We knew this might happen. They would connect over text messages. There wasn't as much social media. They were coordinating appearances so that they would be looking people in the eye while they testified and being present to force some accountability, some kind of accountability. Is that part of what you do as a core participant is just be present and continually advocate for some accountability for what happened? Absolutely. I mean, you hit the nail on the head there. And I feel a great affinity with those widows. We have many widows in our group, not just widows, you know, bereaved children and and siblings and so on. But uh, yes, one of the things, for example, when one particular politician came whom I personally hold responsible for a lot, uh, we were there and we, we can sit in the public gallery and we're about 20 feet from the witnesses and we sit there with our loved ones' photographs in our laps. Ooh. Um, I actually waited for his car when he arrived. I had pictures of my husband with him, this particular politician, because he had had a photo op with my husband. And then I had a picture of his coffin. Uh, he he barely glanced <laughs> glanced at me as he got out of his car. Oh, I'm mad just hearing this. Oh. But there was a ton of press there that day, because there are when you get the big profile politicians. So I thought, okay, he may not want to see. I think they do. And I turned. And and it's true. It's that kind of publicity is important. I'm spoke, one of the media spokespeople for the group as well. And it's important that we keep our story out there and keep it keep it alive because it is about accountability. I've also, I, for me, the main goal is to make things better in the future. Yes. But of course there has to be accountability as well. I, I want to take this chance actually to correct a little or just to maybe cut off uh, one road because a lot of people don't quite understand. They think it's something to do with compensation or money. It's nothing to do with that. No. There is no question. There is no compensation. There is no, it's nothing to do with that. This is about how the government, what actions can be taken in the future. That's it. Because uh, I think some people may, might think cynically that it's, and it's not it's zero. To this do is, with that. So this is not a civil suit. This is not for damages. You are not trying to achieve a certain monetary compensation. What you're actually trying to do is to force future governments to move beyond suggestions or ideas into, no, y'all actually have to do this if some, this happens again. Because I mean, Look at how many similarities there were between COVID and the Spanish flu. And there's so many more of us humans on the earth and we're all connected and traveling a lot. This type of thing will happen again. Your goal is if we do have this problem, we're not going to stand around and say it's not a problem. We're not going to pretend like it's not happening. You ha- you, it's, it's about compelling the government to respond in a particular way to prevent this type of thing from happening again to people. You're absolutely right. Two points for what you've just said. What I find interesting about the uh, flu epidemic, the Spanish flu epidemic, what is similar as well is, I don't know if you find this, I do, just because of my particular position in this, uh, people are now just a little bit like, they want it to be over. Yeah. They just want to la, 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 la. They want to move on. And interestingly, and in what we've read about, because do a bit of research into the Spanish flu, it wasn't that it was magically not that bad or just disappeared or whatever people it was the same thing people did not want to talk about it they wanted to put it behind them yeah that was one thing the second thing is some of the evidence i heard in module one from the scientists was you know pretty 
eye opening because there was one who just said, it is coming again. It's going to be much worse and it's going to be soon. Some scientists are saying that. So the more we can prepare now, Mm -hmm. the better. I think this is one of my issues as well. It's one thing to wait for Baroness Hallett's recommendations. Great. The the recommendations are now uh, public. So any government, including one we have at the moment, could look at them and say, hey, why don't we implement some of those now? Nothing's stopping them. And that this is the thing. I, I feel sometimes like governments won't do anything until they're forced to, absolutely forced to. It's and true. we're the ones who suffer. Yep. And you have to hold people over and over. And you also have to keep reminding people of something that was painful and scary. And I used to think this was just an American trait, um, especially after 9-11. Like, we, we, we don't like being sad all at the same time. I mean, also America is such a big ass country. We don't do anything at the same time. We've got like seven time zones. We can't even celebrate the new year together, but we can be bereaved together. And we we have been, and we don't like being unhappy. Americans like to be happy. We're very gregarious. We do not like to be unhappy. And I think that um, that is actually a commonality with a lot of people. We don't want to think about how miserable and scary that was. It sucked. It sucked a lot. And it sucked big time. It was terrible. We were, I'm not a mm-hmm. fan, zero stars. It, it COVID gets a very bad Yelp review from me. But <laughs> if you don't look at how bad it was, it'll happen again. Um, I happen to be Jewish and we talk a lot about the Holocaust. Ask me why we do that. Because we don't want it to happen again. Because it might. Because it yeah. has. Because it will. Because this is... You know, to, car- to quote Carl Sagan, we've traveled this way before. There's much to be learned. What are some of the things that you have learned that have helped you as being part of one of the core participants in the inquiry? Look, I'm trying to say it both ways in one word. It's just not working. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Say it your way. I'm, I'm happy. I mean, I could say inquiry. <laughs> I, it's one of those words when I'm narrating an audiobook. I have to consciously think, oh, no, inquiry, inquiry. I think what I've learned is that even one person can make a difference. Yes. I've learned that uh, actions are not futile. I've learned a lot, at quite a cost, but a, a lot of empathy. And I've learned how grief can destroy some people and how traumatic it is and how gentle we have to be with each other. I've learned, well, I'm afraid I've learned to be more cynical when it comes to those in power. I do not believe they have our best interests at heart. I think those days are gone. And I've learned that we can't just uh, sit back and assume, for leading on from that point, we can't just sit back and assume that people are doing things, that things are happening yeah. for our benefit or just to keep us going. They're not. And we all have to be involved. I didn't expect <laughs> return to activism at this stage of my life, but I see now how important it is. Yeah. And that if you can show up and be present, it makes quite a difference. Yeah. One of the things that I did, I was sitting with our lawyers uh, during one of the preliminary hearings, and he mentioned that they were going to do a podcast just saying what had happened that week in the inquiry. And so I said, oh, you know, this is not outside my wheelhouse. You know, That's entirely in your house of wheels. Are we joking here? (laughs) So um, they asked me to help. And so we did that every week with the lawyers. We did different guests, usually other lawyers. And we would kind of, and because I'm like the stupid lay person, I could ask, because it's, it's, it is very legalistic, very dense, a lot of the, very scientific, a lot of the time. So I would just say, what does this mean? What does that mean? And they would explain it in a more, you know, user-friendly way. So we did that once a week. And I think we're going to do it. We'll be doing it again in the second module. So um so that was fun. I guess that's another thing I learned. It's like you never know when your skills can come in handy in a different way Absolutely. than you originally planned. That was fun. And mm-hmm. and like I said, it's on the Brody Cantor Jackson YouTube channel. I'm yeah. going to, I will link to it, never fear. So I also want to ask you about the COVID memorial wall. And I know I've seen the wall in footage of the queue of people waiting to see the queen when she was lying in state. Tell me about the COVID memorial wall, because that's another activist and volunteer thing that you're doing. And it's it's also really beautiful. Tell me all about it. Yeah, I tell you what, you know, the inquiry is like my battle and the memorial wall is my refuge. Um, oh, lovely. <laughs> so a little bit about the history of the wall. It started as a guerrilla action, you're right. And it was done 
well, almost overnight. It, it was coordinated through COVID Bereaved Families for Justice and a political activist group called Led by Donkeys who are amazing. I'm sorry, led amazing. by donkeys? Led by donkeys. Yeah. Amazing. It's a quote from something. We are led by donkeys. What are we? Something I don't even know what the origin of the quote is, but they're just these amazing uh, people who've just done incredible. Largely, they started around Brexit. I'm sure you guys have heard of Brexit and and everything about that. And then they joined up with COVID brief families, and they wanted to do a piece of art. And they found a wall which is right across from the Houses of Parliament, right across from the seat of power on the South Bank. The location is perfect half a kilometer of Portland stone wall. And they had signs made. It all looked very official. Uh, people wore tabards. They asked for volunteers and they put all these hearts on. And that the painting went on for several days. It was not originally intended to be permanent. It was intended to be a piece of activism. But then people started coming. They started claiming hearts as their own, putting their loved one's name on it. At the thing at that point, there's one red painted heart for every person who died in this country of COVID. At that point, it was 150,000. That's still true. There's still a heart for every person, whether or not it has a name is irrelevant. There's a red heart for every person who died in this country. It's over 220,000. Wow. And as people started to come, it sort of took on a life of its own. And we, through one of our members named Fran, she sort of started a subgroup called Friends of the Wall, and some of us joined up. And our our mission is to preserve the wall. So that's part of what we do, because originally they used art pens, which don't last. No, those will wash and, in the rain. Yeah, they stayed in the rain, but they fade very, very quickly. They get sort of absorbed into the wall. So we have repainted every heart with red masonry paint, a uh, half a kilometer of hearts. It's it's quite, and that that goes on. There are still ones we're still refreshing, we're still restoring, and it's become kind of this mammoth project. We do dedications for people who can't get to London. They they contact us if their loved one died in the UK of COVID. We we will dedicate a heart for them, and for many people, this is one of the reasons it's meaningful. Is that some people don't don't have a grave you know they don't have a grave for their loved one or they couldn't get a headstone or whatever this is the memorial to their loved ones and it's very precious to them and a lot of we go every week and restore and do dedications and we also sometimes have to minister to people because people come visit the wall it's very emo- emotional for people to visit their heart for the first time we also uh, try to publicize it that image is now iconic it's It's used in many news reports. It's used as the background. Our goal is for the wall to be made permanent. We've had a few visits from the um, Commemoration Commission, which decides these matters or makes recommendations on these matters. And I believe their recommendations will be published soon. So we're really hoping that it will be made permanent because then because at the moment it's there's nine of us, nine yeah. women who maintain this wall. It's it's a lot. That is a lot. <laughs> and that's all that's all volunteer and donations. That's not yeah. any federal funding. That's not any government funding. No. That is just volunteer no. labor and donations from yeah. people. Nine nine of us, nine of us volunteers. Nine. And we have a we have fundraising page as well. And people do donate. Sometimes they press money into our hands the wall, which is nice. And we also are very lucky in that we do have a little bit of, I don't know if you call it corporate sponsorship, but people like Sharpie, they donate pens to us. Um, there's a, a Valspar donates some paint to us. So we do get some, some materials are donated and some we have to buy. So it is, it's like on a shoestring, but, but we manage it and it's, it's just, it's one of the most meaningful things I do. I think in this life, especially since Vince died, I kind of, I just want, I want the rest of my life to have meaning and I don't want to waste time. And this is one of the most meaningful things I do. I mean, today, for example, um, we were contacted by a lady. She lost a seven-year-old son oh. to COVID. I know this boy's heart. I did his heart. I put his dedication on. And it's, this is what we call it wall magic. And last week, I I went to visit it, have a look at it. And I refreshed the outline and I did a little TikTok of it. I obviously keeping him anonymous. And anyway, his mother, having not seen that, she contacted us today and said, could you please check my son's heart to make sure it's still okay? And I said, wow, you know, I just did. Here's the video of me doing it. 
And that that particular heart really gets to me because I think people don't realize children died. Yes, it may mostly have been old people, but children died of this disease, this virus. So it's moments like that. And you just think, and it means so much to her. And and I can tell that. And that, that means a lot to me. It's very rewarding. One of the things I learned during COVID, um, I, I, I personally do not like gatherings. A group of people is called a no thank you for me. But I recognized even after a few weeks of COVID that the absence of the opportunity to come together and say something has ended or something has begun, whether it's a funeral or a graduation, the absence of the opportunity to come together in, in, a, in a group acknowledgement and say, this has happened and we are changed is a great loss. It's striking to me, if you look at history, we've had these things happen. We have, we have the COVID Memorial Wall. We have the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall. We have the 9-11 Monument. We have the AIDS quilt. Remember the AIDS quilt? It's now so big, you can't put it anywhere. There's no space big enough to hold the whole AIDS quilt. Like That's staggering. We are so, as humans, we're so creative in coming up with ways of saying, I was here and this person was here and I miss this person. And here is the thing that lets me think about them. I'm going to get choked up now. Excuse me. I oh. keep tissues at my desk. <laughs> I, think what, I think what you're saying, what you're saying is very interesting, Sarah, and it's true. And I think that's one of the reasons why COVID grief, along with, I imagine, other types, is so specifically difficult because we couldn't mourn. I think it was, I can only speak for myself, but I'm sure this experience was shared when, because Vince died early in it. And we did the funeral. It was 20 minutes there were six people and or eight people and but no one could sit with me. No yeah. one, you know. And then I went home. We did do a little drink on Zoom later, but and then we were in lockdown. And it's silent. So I was like alone with this horrible grief. And many people were in that position. And it it I grieve, you know, I grieve both my parents. I understand at least how I operate in grief. I know kind of the steps that I tend to go through. This is completely different. I didn't, it kind of took me by surprise. And that's why through more than three years on, I still feel almost as traumatized as I did at the beginning. Although with my new, I do feel purpose now. So that that's helped somewhat. But it it is that morning rituals are so important. And getting back to the wall, which as you mentioned, I think these, that's what's so special about it. It's collective. Yeah. It's made by the bereaved for the bereaved. It's a piece of collective art, collective mourning. And I think it's especially beautiful for that reason. And it's also extremely visible. So I know here in, in the States, there's a, a pretty, pretty strong and loud uh, movement of people declaring COVID is over. We don't have to worry about it. And there are state laws that like prohibit mask requirements. And I kind of pay attention to the surges and the up and the down. So I am back to masking inside locations because cases are going up. I wear masks on the public transportation. And sometimes there's like a couple other people. But for the most part, there's a part of me that's kind of ready for somebody to say something to me. Like I'm kind of like braced for somebody to, to scold me or somehow interact with me and say, you know, I'm being silly. Like, first of all, what do you care? Why do you care? Why do you care to have on my face? But I also know that these people are in the UK. And I imagine that when you're at the wall, you get some gr grieving people and some people who are looking for connection and then some people who are looking to do, do something else. We do. It's a sad fact that we do get abuse uh, almost every time we're there. Sometimes it's very polite, like <sighs> just they don't believe it. You know, it's like, oh, they didn't, they didn't die of COVID. It, you know, all one thing, every volunteer is bereaved. That's one of the requirements to be a volunteer. You must be COVID bereaved. And I just think, whatever your beliefs, even if you think COVID doesn't exist, as you know, some people do, why are you picking on the bereaved? Our people died. You may not believe they died of that, fair enough, but why do you abuse the bereaved because of that? So I find that, and sometimes it's definitely the the full on, full on people shouting obscenities and all that kind of thing. You just kind of 
ignore it. We do get graffiti sometimes. But you're there and you're visible. Yeah. So that you might as well yeah. be the one to... to, to it, 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 is, it is staggering to me in any context to yell at someone who is being public with their grief. Like, what? who, who raised you? What are you doing? <laughs> My God. Right? I mean, I do find it, I find it just very strange. Very strange. Why would you do that? Why would you, why would you be so cruel? Why would you yell at someone who's grieving? Like, what? Mm-hmm. What? Oh, for heaven's sake. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's one of the downsides of, um, of being a, a volunteer. Happily, we're a really tight knit group. And if one of us is, feels weak or, or attacked or whatever, you know, the others will rush into support. We do. I'm very proud to say there are a couple of our ladies are nicknamed the angry birds and um, <laughs> they don't hold back. Oh, they I would not mess opinions. with any person who is <laughs> nicknamed an angry bird. Holy cow. <laughs> what are some of the things that you do at the wall? You repaint the hearts, you write names on them. Do you have to like weatherproof them or do you just repaint them as they fade? Yeah, that's an interesting question. We To answer the first part, we, yes, we do. We restore hearts. I have to say, I'm very proud of us. We're very organized. We now, we keep, um, we have records, we keep photographic records, we keep, um, not of the people who requested it, because, but, it, you know, with the names of the dead and and where they're hard, the location mm-hmm. of the heart, because it's a half a, half a kilometer. It's, it's a lot. You know, yeah. It's a long wall. You have to know. And we put numbers at the top of each panel. And we have a lot of old photographs from when they were first made. So, we're very good at finding hearts, sometimes to restore. If we can see the writing, we'll restore it. If we can find a historical record, we'll restore it. So we do that. That's very time-consuming part of our work, but I, I find it the most gratifying. I really love finding a heart. One heart, it took me three weeks, and I found it. I knew I could find it, and I restored it. We paint new hearts, and we also um, engage with people. That's part of our job, I think, is to inform. Yeah. I think we can be educational. Sometimes we'll get young people from the continent and they'll come and they'll look and they'll be very impressed with the wall. To see it visually represented. It's stunning. Is, you get it. You can read a number on a page, but when you see it, and, I, and I've had them say, say, wow, this many people, amazing. Thank goodness it's over. Uh, and you have to say gently to them. You have to say, well, it's not. It's not. Not as many people are dying, but people are dying. That's one thing we do at the wall as well. I believe we're the only public space in this country to every week put the number of COVID dead. So we have a banner and we change out the numbers every week based on the whatever we we go online and find out how many people have died that week. And we just keep it updated, not to be morose or whatever, but just so that people know people are still dying, not in the same numbers, but we have to be aware. That's part of the activism is to say this is still happening. Yeah. Yeah. We're not saying even change what you do, but don't close your eyes. You have to be aware. Uh, and you've asked for preserving. Now, this is interesting because part of it, we've become involved with so many interesting people. One of them is a group of scientists who are studying the effects of how paint fades on <laughs> particular surfaces. <laughs> so, you got the paint scientists. <laughs> so they come, they come and they've measured and monitored. Um, we have certain hearts that they they measure and see how it's fading. And it's like, great, we're contributing. The wall is contributing to this research, this scientific research from one of the universities. So terrific. But we have, and we haven't, I think we're waiting until we know for sure if the wall will be made permanent, because then it's going to be a very different kettle of fish. There will be more people involved in the decisions about how it's going to be preserved we do, we have started varnishing some hearts. The other thing, the wall is Portland stone, which breathes. Yes. So we don't want to do anything too radical. Yeah. So some hearts we varnish after we've um, painted them. And some we just we just keep repainting. Um, so that's that's the life of a volunteer. I, I do have to say, another part of being a volunteer, if you're very lucky, is one of our number is the most brilliant baker. Oh no! And you might eat, yeah, you <laughs> might get a you might get a nice cake every week, and she's she's such a lovely girl. She made us two weeks ago. We had she made individual chocolate cheesecakes with heart decorations and a heart spoon to eat it with. No, these are these women. These are these women. They are so loving and giving. Now, I didn't put this in my list of questions, yes. um, and you can absolutely skip this. Would you tell me something about your husband? 
because I did not, <gasps> I did not know him. But yeah. I would, I would be really honored if you would, you know, share a memory of him. I, I would love to. Um, I might get emotional. That's okay. It's just emotion. But he was. Uh, <laughs> I like to tell the story about how we met. We met at the BBC. We were both. Oh, hired. okay. We were, uh, <laughs> As you do. Yeah. <laughs> As you do. Well, he was, in, but, but listen to this. So we met at the BBC and yet our mothers live 80 miles apart. He's, you know, he was, uh, he's American, he's Italian American. And when I first met him and I remember I looked across at him, we were both early. It's our thing. And something about his face, I just, I felt like I knew him, you know, and it wasn't love at first sight. It wasn't anything like that. I, but I felt something. It was like I looked at that face and I felt something. And then, and then he spoke to me and he said, let me see your paper. And I thought, what an asshole. <laughs> and I just thought he was the biggest asshole. We had to work together for a week. <laughs> and so I knew I had to get all, but I didn't like him at all. And then I, but I, you know, I, I tried to win him over with my, I was really charming because I thought, God, this guy, yeah. Um, but it worked too well, and he asked me out, and I didn't want to go out with him. Uh, so I broke the date, and then we we started talking on the phone about something. Else. He phoned about something anodyne, like, oh, he'd heard about a casting that I might be, or something like some actor to actor. And and he was different on the phone. So we talked on the phone for a couple weeks, and then we met up again, and then that was that. But he was just, besides being very handsome, he was really funny. He just had a very observational sense of humor. He was so funny. No wonder he moved to England. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so wise. And he, I, mean, I remember his, I often thought I should do a little book, The Wit and Wisdom of Vince Marzello. My best friend was, she was very vexed about something. She was upset. And she was, she and I were, you know, talking and talking. And he just walked by as we were talking. He went, Aaron, I'm going to give you the two word passport to sanity. Fuck him. He, <laughs> <off. laughs> he would just always come out with things like that. But he had a quality, and I think it's this that is ineffable, hard to explain. He was so lovable. There was just something about him that was lovable. I just I just loved everything about his face. And this is more than handsomeness, you know. It's just loving that face. When he died, I, how long have we been together? 32 years. And a um, long time, you know, best part of my life. And and I just, I was in love with him at the end as much as, more, more than at the beginning. And I've never had that. He was 100% on my side. He was a delight in every way. And we just got along really well. And I miss him. He was one of a kind one of a kind. Thank you for asking. Sometimes people are afraid to talk about our lost ones, aren't they? Yep. Yeah. And and yet the bereaved love to talk about our oh, loved ones. Oh, of course, ones. You know, absolutely. We, because you're you're the one you're the one carrying these memories. Yeah. Yeah, and keeping them alive and so I do like to talk about them and I still he still makes me smile. Sometimes I'll remember things he said and I just think, wow, that's a power. That's a superpower. Oh yeah. Beyond the grave even. I myself do not believe in life after death. Uh, I'm Catholic culturally, but I I don't really believe in life after death. I don't, that's incorrect. I don't believe in the survival of the personality after death. Let's put it that way. And I didn't dream about Vince until one night, I don't know, maybe it was a couple of months after he died. And he came to me in a dream and he was, he was like beautiful. He was, he was in his prime, like say 40, gorgeous. He had a saint's eyes, really shiny and bright. And he looked at me with such tenderness and he said, you're a billion years old and you're made out of stars. And I, I remembered that and I thought, oh my God, that is what a message to get. If you're only going to get one message, I had it engraved on the back of his headstone and I looked it up. I thought, is this a poem that I know, but I can't find it anywhere. I think it was his, you know, I'll, I'll always treasure that. That was a really special moment. Thank you for sharing him. Yeah. Oh, thank you for asking. I'm, like I said, I'm delighted. Listeners, we're all taking time out over here to wipe our eyes. So if you need a break, you need to grab a tissue, please feel free. 
I also want to ask you to yes. change direction just a little. Mm. What are you working on in audiobook land, ma'am? Yes, audiobook land. Um, well, I've just finished recording Janet Ivanovich's latest Stephanie Plum, which is Dirty 30. 30. Can you believe that? 30. No, <laughs> not. <laughs> I remember when I first started recording her books. I recorded the British versions, which were abridged. I mean, this is this is back before cell phones. And it was four to score was the first one. And it was what they called an emergency record. I don't know why. It was it had to happen at the last minute. So they phoned and said, Yep, for this emergency record. I thought it was going to be a lady detective y, you know, kind of thing. And I said, sure. They sent me the script. And I started to read it. And I just thought, oh my, this is so fresh, so original. This voice yep. is like nothing I've ever heard before. Are there any books that you have read or are reading that you would like to tell people about? I always ask because, well, I have very poor impulse control when it comes to books. <laughs> oh, I, boy, I hear that. So I've read a lot. And, and as a narrator, though, because you have to read so much for work and you read different kinds of things. And this is great because it can introduce you to new genres that I might never have come across and all that kind of thing. But I don't get that much chance for leisure reading. Having said that, I've also started directing audiobooks uh, in the past couple of years more, which I really enjoy. Not because I'm bossy. Who said that? I didn't say um, a word. I would <laughs> never have thought such a thing. No. <laughs> no. Um, so I think in terms of narrating what I've really enjoyed, obviously the Stephanie Plums. But I was really sad to finish the Dorinda Jones trilogy, the Sunshine Vikram trilogy. That was such a fun, fun series. But I'm still... Um, I'm still doing her super spicy novellas that are set in the, uh, you know, Grim Reaper world, still doing that. But one of the series is interesting. It's another trilogy. It's by PC Cast. I don't know if you know it. It's the Into the Mist series. I and... know PC Cast from way mm. back in the day. She was a fan of the site and used to write these books about <sighs> goddesses coming to earth or trading places yeah. with the human body. And she wrote the website into one of them as a way in which the goddess learned about life on earth. And when I tell you, I, kidding. I had an out of body experience when I saw that. That that would be so thrilling. Oh I, my, I can imagine. was beside myself entirely. Yeah. Oh, I love that. This new this series that I'm doing for it's great. It's kind of a it's a post apocalyptic dystopian, which I love. I love all that stuff. A trilogy about a bunch of women who you know in their post apocalyptic life, and it's it's really I find it very interesting. And it's about survival, and so I I really enjoyed that. But and and in my directing, I think the book I that had the biggest impact on me. I don't know if you know. It's called My Murder by Kate Williams. This book has the freshest, most original concept that I've heard in a while, which is essentially, um, it's not a spoiler because I believe it's in the, you know, whatever it's in the, the color copy. But yeah. It's about, yeah, it's about murder victims, uh, a serial killer's murder victims being brought back to life as part of a special government, whatever. And one of these revived women tries to solve her own murder. Ooh. And it's just, I've got, see, I've got goosies even remembering it. I just loved it. I found it so fresh. And I directed that for um, Penguin Random House. And it was narrated by Rebecca Lohman. She was fabulous. Not that I'm jealous. <laughs> Not that I'm jealous at all. But because um, I got to, I got to read the book as well. But she did a terrific job. So I highly recommend that one. If you like things slightly darker, it's wow. good. Thank you. And thank you so much for doing this interview and telling me all about all of the things that you're doing. I'm I'm really honored that you shared so much with me. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. I'm just, I'm really, it's so nice to be, I mean, obviously I love talking about our business, the book business and the audio business, but it's really nice to be asked about other things too. Where can people find you if you wish to be found? Because some people don't want to be found. Some people are like, please don't find me. No, I I really like interacting with with people. Um, well, as we touched on earlier, you can usually find me at the COVID inquiry or the <laughs> memorial wall. But if you're talking about online, uh, I have my website, laurelaking.com. I'm on Twitter. I cannot call it X. I'm sorry. No. Uh, as as Laura Lai King, and I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Pro, and Threads as Laura Lai King official. Oh, and I just started dabbling on TikTok. I know I'm really late to the game, but it's kind of fun. 
I've only just started. I'm more addicted to watching them. Oh my God. It's very easy to just go and go and go. And you look up and you're like, why haven't I peed in six hours? And I'm hungry and it's dark. What happened? But I know a lot about online scammers, how to make macaroni and cheese 47 ways. You know, it's just the the subjects are so varied. It's, It's very interesting. Is this important life information? Yeah. You never know when it's going to come in handy. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. And I want to send a very special thank you to Lorelai King for being so honest and open with us. I will link to the COVID Inquiry podcast and to the Memorial Wall website in the show notes. And you can find that at smartbitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast under episode number 582. Coming up next week, beginning on October 6th, we are starting a new project here. And it is called The Romantic Times Rewind. I've gotten my hands on some back issues of Romantic Times magazine. If you know that magazine, you know how many books are in it. And for two episodes each month, Amanda and I will be looking back through a particular month of RT magazine, a Romantic Times. Sometimes it was called RT Book Lovers. Sometimes it was called Romantic Times. But it went dark in May of 2018. And there are so many books to discover in the history of Romantic Times. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a deep dive into each magazine. We're going to look at the reviews by genre. And then we're going to look at the ads and the features. If you are a member of the podcast Patreon, you will get a scan of the entire magazine as part of your membership. And you can read along with us and also enjoy the absolutely incredible ads. Oh, my goodness. If you have back issues of Romantic Times magazine, digital or print, and you would like to send them to me, I would be delighted to hear from you. You can reach me at Sarah at SmartBitchesTrashyBooks.com. Please put Romantic Times Rewind in the subject line so I do not miss it. My inbox is a little full of mayhem. And I hope you enjoy this trip down memory lane on the podcast as much as I do. I'm also going to be putting pictures from the episode and the issue up on the website and on Instagram. And because I just want to Tumblr, SmartBitches.Tumblr.com. Because if we're going to go retro, we're going all the way and I can't use MySpace. As always, I end with a terrible joke. This joke comes from Clay, who likes to drive with cows. All right, this is from one of Clay's youth patrons. So clearly, everyone who goes to Clay's library is awesome. You ready? What do you call an undead cheese? Give up? What do you call an undead cheese? A zombie. Oh, well played. Very, very good. Excellent. I would give that a solid, solid stinky cheese egg. On behalf of everyone here, we wish you the very best of reading. Have a wonderful weekend. We will see you back here next week. Smart Podcast Trashy Books is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find outstanding podcasts to subscribe to at frolic.media slash podcasts.